I had a, gr- a great talk you'll hear next week um, on Ephesians. And then I was just praying Thursday morning about our leader- leadership gathering coming. Um, I felt like this talk needed to be shared for the whole church. And it's a, it's a prophetic word. And I don't say that um, flippantly. I'm not saying that unintentionally. I'm saying that very intentionally. Because um, one of the things I've realized is as a church, we have received prophetic words from prophets and from people in our community. And I don't know if we have learned to really respond to the prophecies we've received. And I'm committed that this next season, however long it takes, we build a supernatural culture in our church that sees signs and wonders, healing, salvation, miracles like never before. I I believe that God wants that for us. But in order to to become that kind of community, which I, I feel like for most of us, we haven't experienced a church like that. We haven't been a part of a community that's beyond preaching, which is great, worship, which is great, small groups, youth ministry, kids ministry, that's great. But an expectation that the truth of the New Testament would become reality here and now, that's kind of vague and often not taught or expected by the church today. Would you agree? I, at least that's my perception. And, and so I'm going to preach, uh, Lord, uh, give me wh- everything I need. But I want to say the, the prophecy, just before I, 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 sh- I share, I just want to give you a quick disclaimer. Prophecy is a gift of revelation in the church, for the church. And God chooses to speak his truth to a specific group of people or person by a specific person for a specific time and moment. And in prophecy, he reveals himself, a a truth about himself or about a community for a moment. In the Old Testament, what we see is prophecy is used regularly by God with prophets where God speaks to individuals, kings, and nations like Israel and communities to bring about a realignment of his way. In the New Testament, we see God reveals his desire and his heart when the Holy Spirit comes on the church. And it says in Acts 2 that when the Spirit of God comes upon the church, everyone's going to prophesy. That sons and daughters, it will be the Spirit will just fill us and we'll have access to these gifts. And now it's not just for these special people for a specific time. It's now available to the whole church. Because all of the ministry of, the, uh, of Jesus is available for all of the church. Yep. So when we limit ministry to what happens with one person preaching at one time, we just kill the church. And when we just think the point of Sunday is for me to get the meat from a preacher, we miss what God might have for a moment that changes your life. There have, there ha, there's been few sermons I can remember that, has changed, that have changed my life. But a collection of sermons over my lifetime, from Rock Harbor to Bill to this church, my life is completely different as a result of consistent word of God being preached over a long period of time. But then there are these moments where God breaks in and it, it disrupts everything. That's a prophetic moment, word. And for the last 12 years, there, as a church, we've had these prophetic moments, where moments where God uses leaders and people that we're connected to and people in our church um, that, that change the course of how we do things. The purpose of a, of a prophetic revelation is about repositioning and preparation. I want you to understand what prophecy is for. If there is prophecy, then God's people must reposition their lives. That often comes first through repentance, which is to change direction, right? Change one's mind, reposition. But also it moves the church to prepare. And in their preparation, revelation through prophecy brings about provision. Now, I'm going to say, what I'm preaching right now I'm going to say this with absolute confidence and certainty. It's for those that have ears to hear. I believe the Spirit of God will open your mind to understand a new truth if you open yourself up to the Holy Spirit. So I'm about to preach something from the story of Gideon. 
And I think what God is going to do is disrupt the church. Because this was a word given to us, I preached this in January 2019. In January 2019, I said, I believe there's a time coming when the church will be like Gideon. I called it the Gideon moment where we must recognize, and I'll talk about the specifics, but you get to the end of this text and what happens in the story of Gideon is the church will get smaller, but it will get stronger. So let's dive into the text and I want you to see the ways God has been preparing us for such a time as this. I'm not going to talk about the prophecy we had in January, February, and March of 2020, preparing our church for a global uh, tsunami, if you will, of shutdowns. Where in February 2000, uh, 2020, we sent emails to our staff saying, we think we're going to have to be on live stream only. Please, please get ready for live stream. That was a revelation that God gave our church. And we responded and we were prepared to go online. We held a citywide meeting for 45 plus churches the Thursday before the shutdown where Pastor John and I talked to the churches of Long Beach saying there's a pandemic, things are gonna be disrupted. The pastors in the city came, they thought we were crazy. They thought, they, and I quote, we thought we were gonna learn how to take communion during a pandemic. And we were saying to everyone, you're not going to gather for a season. The clo- we're going to shut down everything. We got to be ready. You got to go online. We gave them a playbook to do live stream. How, why were we able, people thought we were crazy. We were responding to the prophetic words God gave us. He wants to release this for community. And if you're interested in this conversation, stick around for the leadership community because we're going to talk about how we go there. So, If you have a Bible, Judges, I only have like 25 minutes. So here we go. It's a 60-minute talk in 25 minutes. Here we go. Judges chapter 6. I'm going to go through this quickly and try to give you what I can. But I just want to, if you want to hear the other talk, it's in January of some time in 2019. It was called the Gideon moment. But I believe this is appropriate for us. I believe the Lord is leading us practically to do some things that requires repositioning, preparation um, for what God wants to bring as provision for the future church in the West. How's that for an introduction, by the way? Yeah. Judges chapter 6, verse 1. If you're trying to find Judges, um, it comes after Joshua. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. So Joshua goes into the promised land, secures the territory. He becomes, he kind of defeats the enemies and then, um, and then they're set up. And then we get this story after Joshua's death um, through, the, through Judges. So verse one, it says, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Red flag, in other words. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want that at the beginning of your story. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. For seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites because of the, the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites Amalekites and other Eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. Now, if you're reading this when it was written, this would be like pulling you back to the uh, Exodus story, uh, locusts and swarms and, and live strongholds. All this stuff is like drawing you back to the origin story of Israel. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Ravage it. Verse six, Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hands of the Egyptians. I delivered you from the hands of your oppressors. I drove them out before you and I gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. So setting the stage for the Gideon moment. Israel goes into the promised land. 
Remember the story of promised land in the Old Testament, promised to uh, the ancestors, Abraham, 400 years before they, Moses frees the uh, Israelites out of Egypt and then 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Eventually they get to go into the promised land, a land marked by abundance, flowing with milk and honey. This is what the promised land was, uh, this is what it was described about in the Old Testament. But when we read about the people of God living in the promised land, they're living um, in poverty, impoverished, living, hiding in shelters and caves because they're being defeated and oppressed by a new oppressor. You see, the promised land was given with a condition It was given as a blessing with the condition attached to its blessing. If you obey me fully, you will be my treasured possession, my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. If there was one simple if, obedience to God. You see, our lives will always reflect the promises of God through obedience. They couldn't enjoy the promised land because of their disobedience. Instead, they're trying to survive in the promised land. Isn't that fascinating? They're surviving in shelters, in caves, and strongholds. And what happens when you have a survivalist mentality? You get shaped by that season of survival. If you've ever experienced poverty or read about poverty, we know stories of men and women who grew up in poverty and then they get to a place in their life where they don't struggle with the same things that they struggle with as a child, but they still have a survivalist, a scarcity mindset. So the Israelites are living in this oppression and they cry out to God and God simply sends a prophet to say what they already know. They didn't obey. This is the result of their disobedience and they don't listen. But God is always faithful to his promises. Let me say that one more time for the people in the back. God is always faithful to his promises. Even when you're not faithful, he will remain faithful. Amen. That's what I was waiting for. <laughs> I needed that amen. I had to do a memorial service this week for someone in our church, 28-year-old who tragically died. Friday, his family goes to our church. So when I'm singing in the front, as passionate as I can, that the grave, the grave, Death cannot hold you? Come on. I needed that today, watching a father bury his son. I don't know what kind of truth you're living in, but I'll tell you this. We're trying to survive, aren't we? It seems like the Western church today is teaching survival, not transformation. The Western church is just settled into the promised land, saying our battle is in politics. No, it ain't. So God hears the cries of a nation. Check this out. This is so good. God hears the cries of a nation and goes to a person. He hears the cries of a nation and he goes to a person. Judges chapter six. The angel of the Lord came down and sat under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash the Abizrite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Just, you should just highlight this. This is straight comedy right now. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, who, by the way, was threshing wheat in a wine press, he said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. 
But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. So let me just give you a quick picture so we can understand the context. This is so important. Here's what a first century wine press looked like. Or I'm sorry, this would be an ancient wine press. Do we have that picture? So it's a, basically a hole. Um, with some, uh, uh, another hole, and you throw a bunch of grapes in there, and you step on, on it and walk around in circles. You know what I'm talking about? It's like the I Love Lucy uh, skit, right? Just, so you have a guy not making grapes. He's threshing, sorry, he, he, he's threshing wheat. So this is how you thresh wheat 3,000 years ago. You take the wheat and the kernels, and you throw it up in the air so the wind can blow the chaff and the kernel falls to the ground. So the image of the mighty warrior is cowering in a wine press, throwing up some kernels and wheat and chaff and blowing because there's no wind. You think he's been shaped by seven years of oppression? Do you think he's been shaped by a culture that every time something good happens, that it just gets knocked down by the powerful forces that are like swarms of locusts? Do you think he's been shaped by the fact that he wasn't around when God did show up? Now, the stories of faith are a place for him to dwell in bitterness and anger and resentment so that when the Lord shows up, he doesn't see a new thing. He can only hold his anger at what God did to them and not him. Some of you are here and you're angry and bitter because of your circumstances. You're resentful because of people in this room or not in this room and you've allowed that unforgiveness, that anger, and that rage to keep you from the new thing God is waiting for you to say yes to. When God begins to do something new, he goes to a person, and he meets that person where they are. And then he draws them into who they really are. A coward threshing wheat in a wine press. Greetings, mighty warrior. His language, his ideas, he has a, a lack of faith and, and, and he's holding back because he's been defeated by the circumstances of his context. The Western church is surviving right now. You know that nationally, the average attendance on Sunday for churches is 37% what it was before COVID? 30s, we are 63% less in attendance since March 2020. Giving is in 2021 was extremely low compared to previous years in the past. Like we are seeing the immaturity of the faith. We are seeing the immaturity of believers in moments of crisis. And allowing ourselves to be swept up in the narratives of our culture, which I'm using culture very large and broad. Society, you can talk about the narratives that were being sold through the, the formation machines of media and all of its forms of media, social media, including TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We can also talk about uh, the algorithms that were being fed in the news apps we choose to read. We are being uh, formed by the image of our culture. And it is fear, it is division, it is outrage, it is anger, it is godless, and it is causing division like never before. And as long as we're bathing and swimming in culture, we will live in the circumstances of defeat. We will simply try to survive as the church. And what we've accommodated to is victims. We are victims of these circumstances, powerless 
to bring change, powerless to, to change the government overreach, powerless to change the issues that we face in school systems, powerless to change my marriage because we just can't, we just can't get along anymore. There's too many conflicts that we, powerless to uh, deal with the emotional conflict we have with our relatives, powerless. We have become victims in everything, whether it's mental health or, 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 or anything else. And, and what I see right now is the issues are getting very, very long down a list because we do have serious issues, do we not? Mental health crisis like never before. Anxiety, depression, suicide, all-time high. We are seeing addiction as, at an all-time high. We are consuming ourselves into more debt than ever before in human history, and technology is only making this easier with apps like Amazon Prime, Postmates, and Instacart. God bless all of those things because I can get same-day delivery on any of these random concepts that I have, like a, a weight for rucking in my backpack or, or like little, little things for a party, like little trays of hearts for a party on Valentine's Day. Like we can have it instantly. Gosh, that's amazing. But we're consuming ourselves. Sorry, is this too much? Like inflation. I'm watching it impact the nation, but the church and the way we see our finances, we just want to hold back, right? Got to keep it safe. We don't know what's coming. Ukraine, Russia crisis right now. We don't know what's going to happen to the market. We just need to pull back a little bit. Families, oh my goodness, I keep talking to families. And if I hear someone else wants to move out of state because of the, the crisis we face, well, if all the Christians keep leaving, what's going to happen to California? You weren't promised it. You weren't promised anything except persecution by Jesus and that he'll be with you in it. Come on, church, buckle up. Let's go after the problem. I get it. You want your kids and this and that. There are other alternative ways of creating a heaven culture. Life expectancy continues to drop. Pornography addiction is an all-time high. I just read this statistic that I'm going to share with you. Social media is scientifically making humans worse, yet we won't let go of social media. This uh, from uh, Caroline, Dr. Caroline Leaf's book, Switch on Your Brain. She says, greater social media use is associated with a higher body mass index, increased binge eating, a lower credit score, and higher levels of credit card debt for consumers with many close friends in their social network, all caused by a lack of self-control. Oh, that's really cool, Dee. That's great. <laughs> I, I hear you, but this is like an opioid addiction to the modern self. But hey, let's justify the means for the ends. Which again, this is why the garden stepped off of social media. Because it is a travesty what's happening. It is directly connected to teen suicide and bullying. I mean, come on. This is not a neutral product that makes you feel good. It clinically, scientifically is proven to make you feel worse. And then you get off that, and then you're looking on Zillow for new houses. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> how on earth will we bring heaven on earth? When we, when, uh, how will we train the world to be disciples of Jesus when we don't live on a budget and we don't live generously? When our resources are all about self and comfort, when our healthy relationships aren't anywhere. Instead, we live with our boyfriend or girlfriends, we sleep around, we drink too much alcohol, and we fill our minds with darkness and rush, and rush around exhausted by the endlessness and the endless issues that are following us everywhere we go. How will we train the world to experience heaven here and now when we're burnt out, when we lack commitment, and we're motivated by the feelings in the moment. The church is not a victim. It's like, it's like when the prophet comes and says, I gave you the promised land. I delivered you. I did all these things. I asked you to obey, and you didn't listen. We're not a people we are not people with problems. We are a community with solutions. When we settle with defeat, we become passive spectators. 
rather than active contenders. So when God is doing something new in your life, the question is, will you be a passive spectator or an active contender? God brings something new, and I want you to look at what he does. He hears the cries of a nation, and he goes to Gideon. And I want you to look at Gideon, okay? Because the image we have is so far coward, who doesn't have faith who has a lot of anger, who's got a lot of excuses, but then he has a little bit more. He's going to share more of his issues with this person. He's confronted by God, and God says, you are a mighty warrior. And now he's going to argue to God. Listen to what he says, verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. He just said, where's God? He showed up. How come he's not here? And he, and he says, go in the strength you have. Up until this point, what kind of strength does Gideon have? <sighs> <sighs> right? This is a comedy. This doesn't make sense by the world's standards. This is not how we strategize national change. This is not how we strategize corporate renewal. We don't go to this kind of person. Listen to what he says. Um, pardon me, my Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. I mean, isn't this what we do? God whispers something during worship service about what you're supposed to do. And what do you do? Confront God with all the reasons why that's not for you. You're hanging out in your house church and someone speaks a word of knowledge over you that's about a calling, this idea that's too great to be true. And all of a sudden, instead of saying, thank you, God, for confirmation, you go into self and you begin to doubt everything that's been spoken over you. I see it too many times. Well, you try to jump into making this thing happen, trying to make sense of it. You want to be educated. You want to do all the things rather than saying, thank you, Lord. Show me what's next. Listen to what, he, what goes on. It says, um, the Lord answered, okay, I'm the weakest, I'm the least. I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, all of them, leaving none alive. Get in, yeah. <laughs> get in replied, amen. Get in replied, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring you an offering. So he says, go in the strength. The renewal plan that God has for Israel begins with this guy named Gideon who is insecure, who's the weakest, who's the least, who's terrified, and he wants a sign that he's meeting with God. And then it goes on, and he has a sign. And what is the sign that God will always tell us? Throughout the scriptures, in Genesis and Exodus and Deuteronomy, we get to the New Testament, all throughout the Old Testament. What is God's sign? His presence. If you're looking for anything else, you are, you are settling for something other than the, God's main sign, that his presence will be enough for you to be faithful to what he's called you to. The sign is his presence. We don't need circumstances to change. Lord, just take away all the armies that are coming against us. No, 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 no. Help me to trust your presence with me as I obey the word. God's strategy is always people, not projects. God's strategy, strategy is never a campaign. It's a campaign. It's always people. God's strategy is Gideon. And Gideon can't make sense of it because when you're shaped by scarcity or by culture of fear, what your strategy naturally becomes is the strongest, smartest, biggest, most famous and accomplished person to start this renewal. Gideon had self-doubt, he had insecurity, he had fear, he had resentment, he had anger. What does God see in Gideon? He doesn't have strength, he doesn't have past achievement, he did, all he has is his obedience. I got like six minutes. What makes Gideon a mighty warrior is his willingness to follow God in obedience. God's, God takes Gideon and begins this renewal project. The renewal of Israel begins with uh, an encounter that Gideon has with God. And this is what God always does. Personal renewal begins <clears throat> with a personal encounter with God. And God calls Gideon 
not to be educated in military warfare, not to become some great leader, simply to be obedient to his word. God's calling has nothing to do with your ability to make that calling a reality. It simply has to do with your obedience. And a nation begins to change when one person begins to experience God in a new and tangible way. I don't have time to go through this. I'm just going to summarize what happens next. In verse 25, he finally realizes it's God. And then it says this. Uh, I'm actually going to read this because I think it's so important for this moment. Verse 25, it says, That same night, the Lord said to Gideon, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top uh, of this height using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down. Offer the second bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in daytime. He's still scared, but God still used him. And in the morning, the people came out and saw that Baal's altar was demolished with the Asherah pole beside it cut down and the second bull sacrificed on the newly built altar. They asked each other who did this and they began to investigate it. Gideon becomes a change agent where he will be used, and I'll summarize this in a second, to transform the nation of Israel and defeat the enemies of Israel. But it starts with him confronting the idols in his household. Oh, you didn't see that coming. No, I want to fight culture. I want to protest the government. I want to do all these amazing things. Can we start real quick? I'm sorry. I know you're following me in the camera. Thank you so much. Uh, I love you guys. <laughs> At home, sorry if I'm dodging you over here. <laughs> when it's Bill, all you have to do is keep it and you can just go to sleep. It's right here. The rest, it's like, whew, whew. Can't help it. It's who I am. Like it or love it or leave. Um, most of you already did, so it's fine. You're not here. Um, it doesn't hurt me anymore. <laughs> it did, but not anymore. Um, <laughs> You want to protest? You want to go after those big concepts? Start with the, the idols in your home. Mm. What's in your home right now that has, that's a rival to Jesus' lordship? Is it your, if I were to say, hey, everyone pull out your phones, cool. Can you pull up your spending habits real quick and share it with your neighbor? Just let them, just let them scroll through your B of A account. Wells Fargo. Let them see where your heart really is. Oh, I'm sorry, where your money is. I'm, st I'm just saying Jesus says that's where your heart is. Or, or, hey, you know what? Pull out your screen time. Let's just look at how many hours you're spending on those apps. Which apps do you really like? Do you feel exposed? Anyone feel exposed? Idols. You're carrying around everywhere you go. Your money, your habits, your sexuality, your identity, your, uh, your relationships, the things that you read. Uh, are you more obsessed with the current news than you are of the word of God? How many of us have rivals to Jesus that we're walking into this room with? And we're not willing to reposition our lives because of the Lord. We'll show up on a Sunday for an hour and a half, or if it gets a little long, I'll, I'll bounce out early because they have free coffee. But, oh man, if you start charging for coffee, I'm out. Darren, don't talk about sexuality anymore. Let's talk about your secrets. What are you keeping from your spouse? What are you keeping from your roommates? What do you not want your accountability group to know about the way you live? How's that for households full of idols? You want to transform the nation, become a person of integrity, become a person without secrets, become a person who doesn't hide, become a person who says, yeah, come look at my money. That is a testimony of God's provision and grace and obedience to the way of Jesus, of course. My calendar, absolutely. Absolutely. Let me show you how I live sacrificially to the way of Jesus because I believe there's a transformation coming. Yeah, I can, I can talk about getting the right leaders into positions of power or I could live empowered. 
This is what God always does. This is his strategy. He wants to change the nation. He's going to start with you. Mother Teresa said, you want to change the world? Do uh, go home and love your family. You are a change agent. You are a powerful person. I want to hear you say, I'm a powerful person. It sounds like we people saying something they don't believe. I'm a powerful person. I believe some of you. I'm going to cut a bunch of this stuff out. We need to rebuild our life around the word and allow our, his power to change and transform our decisions, our habits, our choices, our commitments, our finances, our perspective, our mindset. Do we live in scarcity or do we live in abundance? Is there inflation in heaven? Is there a crisis of finances in heaven? Or do we live with a father who knows what we need before we ask? We just haven't asked. I believe this, and I'm going to say this prophetically, and I, I have more to say, but if you are committed to this local church, your life will be transformed. If you have children and they're in our kids' ministry, I believe that the future of the kids at the Garden Church will live differently than the rest of culture. I believe that. I believe that if you learn to pattern your life in a committed way in a local church, a church that's about discipleship, a church that's about global missions, a church that's about the power of God in ordinary ways, you will learn to thrive in culture. I believe that with all my heart. We will see freedom. We will see healing. We will see financial breakthroughs. We will have testimonies of God's provision. My, my house was paid off. Somebody gave me a car. We've already seen it. We're going to see more of that. When you step in to recognize it starts with you and your household. What are you waiting for? This word was already spoken in 2019. Like, well, um, I wasn't here in 2019. Are you a powerful person? What are you going to do about it? <laughs> okay, for the sake of time, the story goes on. People are upset that he burned, Gideon burned down this thing. And essentially what happens is, um, as they're debating and fighting, and as the, the Eastern people uh, come together in alliance to, to, to create a, an army against Israel, the Holy Spirit falls upon Gideon. So he hears God, has excuses, goes home, gets rid of the idols, and then they're, they're literally calling him, um, they give him a new name. Um, they call him, uh, yeah, Baal Peel, which means, um, gosh, it's not here. Uh, basically, Baals will contend with him. And he has this new name, Gideon has this new name, and he, he, the Holy Spirit comes on him. And when the Holy Spirit comes on him, he begins to manifest and fall on the floor. No, that's not what happens. The Holy Spirit comes on and he grabs the trumpet to form an army. He goes from blowing whew, kernels to get to hide from Midian to blowing a trumpet. 30,000 men come to uh, be aside him to fight the army that's too big to even count. And God says to him, there's too many of you. I will not share my glory with man. Get rid of anyone who's afraid. 20,000 people leave. <laughs> Gideon's like, okay, let's go. All right, God, I trust you. And then he's like, no, still too many. Anyone that didn't drink a certain way, they have to go too. They're left with 300 men. I've been in Israel it, called Gideon Springs, this, the location that's a, a site for where this battle took place, where this, the men stopped down to drink, where uh, 7, 000, or, I'm sorry, 9,700 people left the army, and Gideon has 300, and God says, this is right. Against an innumerable obstacles, issues like never before in the history of Israel, God's like, I'll do it with 300. You see, this is what I believe. It's called the remnant. That God has been shrinking the church in the West because it's been tied to politics. It's been tied to consumerism and power. It's been tied to sexuality and addiction, and it needs to be set free, and it needs to be made holy, and the future leaders of the church will look differently than culture because culture's drowning, and we need people who are lifeguards, who are standing on dry ground that can pull them out of their misery and say, I am part of the solution. Go in the strength you have. Get rid of the idols in your household. 
Consecrate yourself from the Lord in, in, uh, before the Lord and repent from your wrongdoing. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and live in obedience with the, the word and become people who contend for the promises of the Lord. Can we pray?